Welcome back to the second half of the lecture, where after the brief overview of the rock record and fossils, we will start to learn about the oldest rocks in Antarctica and begin discussing the history of Antarctica, but with sort of with a highlights type of type of approach. We're not going to learn about everything that's happened geologically speaking to Antarctica and about every phase of life, but we'll learn about some of the more interesting events and you'll at least get hopefully an appreciation of just how much Antarctica has changed since the origins of the Earth. Now, I've mentioned that the oldest rocks on Earth are very poorly studied and poorly known because not many of them are exposed. And Antarctica has an extra impediment to doing geology in that so much of it is covered in ice nowadays. We have rocks that are as old as 3.8 billion years from Antarctica, but, um, but we don't necessarily have a continuous record of rocks since then. We have scattered exposures of rocks in the handful of ice-free areas, like the dry valleys, which are kept free of ice by catabatic winds, areas of the Antarctic Peninsula that are closer to, the, that are surrounded by the ocean and that experience slightly milder temperatures, areas that are kept warm by volcanoes or by the heat of geothermal spots like Mount Erebus or like the spots in the Antarctic Peninsula. And then some of the slopes of the higher mountains and noon attacks, especially in the Trans-Antarctic Mountains. I'll say that for dinosaur fossils, a lot of them have been found in the peninsula because the peninsula is one place where you do have a fair bit of exposed rock. We have managed to piece together a decent history of Antarctica from the small number of fossils that we have found in Antarctica and from the types of rock that we've been able to find throughout the various scattered parts. In a lot of cases, we've had to infer guesses because we are missing, say, rocks from the Ordovician period in one part of Antarctica, but we have some from the Ordovician period from the other side of the continent, and so we can make an educated guess about what conditions and what life were like during that period based on that. But we have only still a fairly basic understanding of what has happened to Antarctica over the past over the past 3.8 billion years when we can identify the first rocks forming. And those 3.8 billion year old rocks are from Precambrian time. And Precambrian time is not actually an eon, an area, a period, or an epoch, but it's a generic term for any time in Earth's history before 540 million years, which is when an event called the Cambrian explosion occurred, and going back to the formation of the Earth. Mega Anum, by the way, or MA stands for millions of years and GA stands for giga on them. And that means billions of years, just like gigabytes refers to a thousand, or excuse me, a billion bytes. And that is quite a big gap of time between the origin of the earth and the Cambrian explosion. And the reason that we don't heavily differentiate Precambrian time, we do have, we do have eons in it and we do have we do have eras and periods in it, but they're not very well defined because we don't have a lot of rocks left from the Precambrian period. And we don't have a lot of fossils left either. The fact is that most of the rocks from this period have been eroded away or from this time have been eroded away. And a lot of the rocks that are left came under so much pressure as they were buried deeper and deeper by younger rocks that they metamorphosed under the heat and pressure and this destroyed any fossils. That is the case with the rocks that are found at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon is mostly made of nice layers of sedimentary rocks and we have quite a few fossils in those. But the oldest rocks at the very bottom of the Grand Canyon are Precambrian metamorphic rocks combined with a couple of igneous, igneous granites and dikes also. And it's remarkable that we even have these rocks but we can't necessarily find a lot of fossils in them. And even on the rare occasion when we do find sedimentary rocks that have fossils in them, we find that they don't have a lot of organisms that we can easily recognize. And the Cambrian explosion is important because it's the point in time when we first start seeing a lot of fossils of organisms that we can easily recognize, that we can easily connect with modern life. Antarctica formed as a craton. Antarctica is, especially East Antarctica, has been together for a very long time. In geology, a craton refers to a massive continent that has been together since Precambrian time, 
which is when most of the, the large continents formed, when you had subduction starting to actually build large bodies of continent. Because most of the most of the large continents have a craton. There's an African craton, a North American craton, and it's often kind of in the center of the continent. East Antarctica especially is a craton. The, the mass of East Antarctica was put together by a series of mountain building and subduction events during Precambrian time, and it has more or less been a coherent block since then. East Antarctica has actually avoided being rifted apart, um, and it's stayed together the entire time. And one reason we've been able to determine that East Antarctica is a craton, even though much of it is covered by the ice, is that we have been able to use satellites to look through the ice to determine how thick the crust is. And it turns out that East Antarctica has very thick crust. Thick crust means old crust because thick crust is formed from the thickness of piles upon piles of sediment accumulating over, in this case, billions of years. So we've been able to find out that the east coast of Antarctica, excuse me, the eastern part of Antarctica is a lot thicker than the western part of Antarctica, which was added to the continent a lot more recently. And we have discovered that east Antarctica pushes down on the asthenosphere a lot more. Now, part of that is from the glacier, but even without the glacier, Antarctica's crust would still be pretty thick and would still be pushing down into the lithosphere, into the asthenosphere more. And that's the principle of isostasy that we talked about before, that we talked about in the last lecture. And the oldest rocks in Antarctica are about 3.8 million years. They're found <clears throat> in Enderby land, which is in East Antarctica, and it is directly south of Africa. And we have found similar rocks in South Africa that indicate a longstanding relationship between the two continents. We have igneous rocks intruded during a mountain building event when we had subduction going on. And then we have metamorphic rocks like gneiss and schist that were made when sediments in the ocean between the two continents got caught up by the two continents being squished together and got metamorphosed into, into schists and gneiss, which is what we find in the Himalaya today. The Himalaya has a lot of metamorphic rocks because you have gotten a big uptick in heat and pressure by just the force of the two continents colliding, those two continents being the Indian subcontinent and the rest of Eurasia in that case. And in Antarctica's case, it was bits of continent being progressively added to each other. The East Antarctic Craton was built from a series of orogenies, and an orogeny is a mountain building event. When you have subduction making continental crust, and then you have the collision of two continents subsequently building mountains and also compressing ocean sediments and pushing them up between the two continents and rendering them into metamorphic rocks. For each orogeny, starting with this one in the upper left corner, the Napier orogeny, and you don't need to memorize all of these. But you'll notice there's a little hatch mark in Enderby land. You see the same spot that was marked on the previous slide. And then you have a little bit more area hatch marked in this case. The black represents continent that's already there. The hatch marks represent new territory. And in each orogeny, progressively more land is added to Antarctica. Progressively more microcontinents are, rafted, are grafted onto Antarctica by these mountain building processes. And once the continents were and, and once the continents were together like this, remember that continental crust doesn't really go anywhere. A lot of the most of the continents were to a large extent formed by the end of Precambrian time, or even honestly quite quite a ways before the Cambrian explosion and thus the end of Precambrian time. And we still do have subduction occurring in parts of the world making continental crust. And we have had some mountain building events since the main series of events that built the Antarctic Craton, but most of the continent was together as one piece well before the Cambrian explosion. After the East Antarctic Craton had been assembled, it is believed that it was in contact with Southeast North America. And you'll notice that this is the equator and that Antarctica actually appears to be in the Northern Hemisphere here. And this is what I meant when I talked about how they've used, um, this, is, this is actually one application of studying the magnetism of rocks is that they can study 
the direction in which the little flecks of iron in the rocks are pointing relative to Earth's magnetic field, and they can make an educated guess as to what latitude the continent was at based on that. And they've also, this is all, and, and the, another situation is that they've found in some cases, they found in some cases evidence of glaciers on continents that are nowhere near the are nowhere near the poles now, but but according to evidence, were much more close to the poles at some other point. In this model, the bit of bit of crust in West Africa was actually pretty darn close to the South Pole, even though it's now much closer to the equator. And geomagnetic studies seem to indicate that Antarctica was indeed pretty close to the equator um, around one billion years ago. It was connected to India, to Madagascar, to Australia, and to, and surprisingly somewhat to southeastern North America during this time. And they have found similar rocks in East Antarctica and in the southwestern United States that have the same sequence of rocks that have similar structures in them that in some cases have similar have similar fossils in them, although there's not as much evidence of that from Precambrian time. And the sweat hypothesis states that southwestern North America, which is where the SW and sweat and sweat comes from, was attached to East Antarctica as part of a supercontinent called Rodinia. And the supercontinent of Rodinia existed before the supercontinent of Pangaea. It actually turns out that the world's continents cycle in and out of being attached as a supercontinent. You'll have the continents come together and they'll stay together as a supercontinent for a relatively short period of time. And then divergent plate boundaries will form. Rifting will form and will start to push the continents back apart again. And the exact reason why this happens isn't that well understood, but a lot of it does appear to have to do with changes in cycling in the mantle. And it's known as the Wilson cycle. This period, this, this, this alternation between continents being relatively spread apart, like they are today, and the continents being all close together. So after Rodinia existed, the continents would come apart again. Pangaea would come after Rodinia, and it would come as the next iteration of the spread apart and supercontinent cycle. Now, life originated in the oceans. Although we've been talking about continents, life didn't actually form very much on the continents themselves. We sometimes have evidence of ocean rocks that ended up exposed above land on the continents sometimes. But whatever early life existed was microscopic, single-celled, and lived in the oceans. And Earth's early environment was a harsh place. There was actually very little free oxygen in the atmosphere, and there was no ozone layer. And that meant that not only, not only could organisms that need to either breathe or need to perform oxygen-based cell respiration, none of those could evolve yet. There was also no ozone layer, and that meant that animals and plants were much more susceptible to ultraviolet radiation. One reason that life began in the oceans is because the oceans pre pre prevent some extra filtering for the ultraviolet radiation. It was much safer to be in the ocean than to be on land. And so life originated in the oceans and the earliest life forms are hypothesized to have been extremophiles and extremophiles still live today. Extremophile is a lifestyle term in biology to refer to an organism, almost always a microbiotic organism that can survive in extreme environments that most other life cannot. And that includes the bacteria that live in hot springs as well as the archaea that live in places like that bacteria and archaea that live in black smokers, as well as in trapped lakes with very little oxygen. And we'll actually come back to this example, but this is Blood Falls in Antarctica, and it's where microorganisms trapped in a lake with very little oxygen actually perform inorganic chemical reactions with the iron and the sulfur in the rocks to get food. And the red color in the water coming out at this one point is from the iron. Actually, it has nothing to do with blood. It just looks like it. And it's kind of a bit, it's kind of horrifying to look at as fascinating as it is. And one of these extremophiles was a variety of organism known as cyanobacteria that actually was able to photosynthesize. And cyanobacteria are actually one of the only groups that performs photosynthesis or the ability to 
use the energy of the sunlight to synthesize sugars that you can use as food. And you might think plants can do that, can't they? As it turns out, plants actually have a symbiotic partnership with cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria, which are also referred to as blue-green algae, appear to have been present by at least 2.4 billion years ago, which is when we get our first evidence of the atmosphere being oxygenated. And as cyanobacteria released more and more free oxygen into the air by photosynthesis, there eventually was enough oxygen in the air for organisms that perform aerobic cell respiration, cell respiration that involves, um, that involves oxygen to survive. And almost all life on earth today performs cell respiration with oxygen. Complex life like animals, plants, and fungi is all descended from a common ancestor that does not have the ability to, that does not have the ability to survive without oxygen, that, that cannot perform, that cannot make energy in their cells without oxygen. And it turns out that plants actually photosynthesize via chloroplasts, which are lit, which are organelles, they're little structures within their cells themselves, that actually appear to be living cyanobacteria. It appears that they have formed a symbiotic relationship, plants have formed a symbiotic relationship with cyanobacteria, and the chloroplasts are actually the cyanobacteria. That refers, to, so that, the hypothesis of endosymbiosis states that chloroplasts originated when another organism, another microorganism engulfed cyanobacteria. And before the cyanobacteria was completely broken down, it began to produce, it began to produce food inside of the other cell. And so instead of completely absorbing the cyanobacteria, the other cell essentially let it continue to live in its cell and produce food. And the, it is believed that the common ancestor, that the ancestors of plants and green algae did this. And it's also believed that the ancestors of red algae and brown algae did this separately. Some of the different groups of photosynthetic organisms are not that closely related actually, but all of the more complex ones that have multiple cells or that just have complex cells in general depend on these chloroplasts. And these chloroplasts appear to be cyanobacteria. And um, the interesting thing is that actually when these cyanobacteria, when cells split in plants, the cyanobacteria inside split as well. Um, that's also true of mitochondria, which are the organelles in the cells of plants as well as animals and fungi that help process energy. Those appear to have been, those appear to, ha those appear to be another single-celled organism that was absorbed as part of endosymbiosis. Now cyanobacteria still exist today and they form structures called stromatolites. And stromatolites are actually a trace fossil. We have stromatolites forming today in these two examples and we also have stromatolites in the fossil record. And we're very lucky to have these stromatolites because microscopic organisms do not fossilize well. They're single cells and it's very unlikely we're going to find a fossil of a single celled organism, let alone one that we can really tell apart from other ones. But cyanobacteria, if they are not being preyed upon by snails and other grazing animals, will actually trap sand. And since these cyanobacteria grow in, grow in mats that will layer on top of each other, they will actually trap successive layers of sand. One growth layer of cyanobacteria will trap a bunch of sand and then more cyanobacteria will start growing on top of it. And the lower cyanobacteria will die out, but the sand will still be there. And so you'll get these layers of sand from successive years in these cyanobacteria colonies. And they lithify into beautiful rocks called stromatolites. And Stromatolites are found in the fossil record. Some of our staff actually have some really nice stromatolites taken from ancient Australian rocks, but they still form today. And that's how we're able to figure out that these stromatolites are in the fossil record and what they are. We find stromatolites in places like Shark Bay, Australia, which is a very salty bay that has very little in the way of fish or grazing marine life. We also find them in Antarctica, they've actually been found growing in a place called Lake Untersee, which is means lake lower, which means lower lake 
um, in German. And it is a lake that is completely covered in ice and they have found cyanobacteria building these cone-shaped stromatolites at the bottom of it, which is really, really cool that we have those growing today in Antarctica. But we can recognize what stromatolites are in the fossil record because we have them today. And that underscores one really important limit we have. And that is that our interpretation of the past is very heavily guided by what we still have today. And sometimes that misleads us. Sometimes we think that organisms look really similar to a modern organism and we assume they're related and it turns out they're not. But we work with the best that we have. And we have found stromatolites in Precambrian rocks and that gives us a sense of when cyanobacteria significantly started to oxygen oxygenate the atmosphere. We also have evidence in the form of banded iron formations. And iron is soluble in water, but the most common oxide of iron, which is Fe2O3, and that is actually rust. That oxide is not soluble in water, in water and if it forms, it will fall out of solution and it will sink to the seafloor as a solid. When cyanobacteria first started releasing oxygen, this led to a rapid oxi oxidation of the dissolved iron in seawater and that iron would settle on the seafloor until the oxygen was mostly used up. Cyanobacteria would release a burst of oxygen and then that oxygen would start reacting with the dissolved iron in the water until it was more or less used up. And the banded, the, the what would happen is that on the seafloor, you would get this distinct layer of, you would get this distinct layer of sediment that has a red color from the rust during the periods in which cyanobacteria had caused oxygen to build up and that oxygen was reacting with the iron in the water. And then when the oxygen had run out for a little bit, the sediment would go back to being gray colored because the oxygen had mostly been used up and it wasn't reacting with the iron anymore. But the cyanobacteria didn't go away and they would over time produce more oxygen and produce more oxygen until eventually there was enough oxygen in the atmosphere to start reacting with the iron in the ocean again. And so you would have alternating layers of red sediments from when a lot of oxygen was present and was reacting with the iron and gray sediments when the oxygen had mostly been used up and was just starting to build up again and there wasn't much in the way of a reaction. And if this seems confusing to you, remember that the ocean experiences gas interchange with the atmosphere. You get oxygen in the ocean because you have oxygen seeping into the ocean from the atmosphere. You have carbon dioxide also seeping into the, into the atmosphere, into the ocean. And so the ocean and the atmosphere are not isolated from one another. This would eventually end because cyanobacteria, as we know today by the fact that we exist, produced enough oxygen for it to use up essentially all of the iron in the ocean. And there is to this day very little iron in the ocean overall because the levels of oxygen in the atmosphere are consistently very high. Whatever iron gets in the ocean very quickly falls out. And the banded iron formations disappear around 1.8 billion years ago. The great oxidation event sounds like a big dramatic single event, but it actually occurs over a pretty broad swath of time. It occurs between 2.5 billion years ago and 1.8 billion years ago. So that's about 700 million years. So it took about 700 million years for oxygen to start piling up and for it to be completely equivalated, excuse me, equilibrated to something resembling the levels that it's at today. And as it turned out, they wouldn't even quite reach the levels that we have at modern times. Even after the great oxidation event, the oxygen levels were still between one and 10% of their, of their modern levels. And it seems that they've reached a scale comparable to modern levels around the Cambrian period, around the Cambrian explosion. And it doesn't seem like a coincidence that a big radiation of the evolution of complex life and the appearance of a lot of modern groups of animals occurs when the oxygen levels go up. Now we would get a small handful of complex organisms near the very end of the Precambrian. And we have some fossils of burrows and embryos and a few broken shells, but the main Precambrian fossils are what are known as the Ediacara biota. And they're impressions found in seafloor mud of organisms that look vague they're, and they're tiny also. This is about the size of a quarter. We have tiny impressions of 
what look like fossils of jellyfish or sea pens or sea squirts. But they don't look all that closely related to these modern groups when you look at them closely. It seems that maybe it's a case of convergent evolution of just jellyfish shaped and sea pen shaped organisms doing well in general. But it's not necessarily clear if they're even animals. It's possible that they're lichens or it's possible that they're like a sister group to animals that died out. These Ediracara these biota have been found on every continent, including Australia, which is where the type specimen was from. They have not been found in Antarctica, though. Um, and it would seem a bit surprising if they weren't anywhere on the continent. It seems more likely that we just don't have the right rocks exposed and that we might have fossils of them lurking under the ice. And short of dynamiting the ice, we're not going to find them right away, but we can make guesses about what type of marine life was in Antarctica at the end of the Precambrian based on the fact that these fossils have been found everywhere else. And it's a good example of how we have to infer what's been going on in Antarctica, sometimes from what's been going on elsewhere. Now, we do have evidence that Antarctica was glaciated near the end of Precambrian time. The current glaciation in Antarctica is in fact not the first time that Antarctica has had ice caps. Ice caps have come and gone throughout Earth's history. And if you remember, scientists discovered evidence of glaciers, sediment deposits that were pretty clearly from glaciers. They found them on continents that are now at tropical latitudes and that actually helped provide evidence for continental drift it appears that there were actually period, there, there was actually a time in Earth's history when there were glaciers that went all the way to the equator. And Earth had a very extreme ice age around 650 million years ago, very early in its history. Earth was essentially the planet Hoth from Star Wars during this time. The planet was almost entirely covered with glaciers and the ocean wasn't completely frozen through, but you still had, a, you still had sea ice covering almost all of the ocean. Scientists were stunned when they came across so much evidence of glaciation from this time, and they had to use magnetic data to confirm that yes, these rocks that appear to have been near the equator around 650 million years ago were glaciated. These rocks that have glaciers appear to have indeed been near the equator. And the cause seems to have been a combination of Milankovitch cycles. It was apparently a period in which the combination of Earth's eccentricity and the tilt and um, degree of Earth's axis combined so that Earth was getting very little solar radiation overall. It also appears to have been a runaway albedo example. As soon as enough ice started to form, that started to reflect away enough solar radiation that Earth's temperatures dropped low enough for ice to start forming even at equatorial latitudes. And it's kind of scary to think about this, that the entire Earth was covered in ice at one point. However, it eventually came to an end. Because tectonic activity did not stop, the plates kept moving, and volcanoes, it turns out, release carbon dioxide. And you get more volcanoes when there is more subduction going on. And there are periods in Earth's histories when there is, when there is more subduction or when there is less subduction. So near the end of Snowball Earth, Earth began to subduct more. There, there, there were more plate boundaries where subduction was happening, and that meant more volcanoes, and that began to cause carbon dioxide to pile, it, pile up enough to bring about an intensification of the greenhouse effect, and that brought snowball Earth to an end. And Earth has experienced several ice ages since then, but nothing quite as extreme as this. And scientists still heavily debate just how the albedo went the, the how the albedo went up so high that the entire earth froze over essentially and it does seem like some of this had to do with this being relatively early in earth's history and that the level of greenhouse gases might not have completely stabilized and since then i will say that greenhouse gas levels have fluctuated they have fluctuated somewhat and they have led to changes in earth's climate but nothing quite as extreme as this now, shortly after Snowball Earth, the Precambrian time ends, and we get to the Cambrian period. And by this point, oxygen levels had gotten closer to what, what they are at the present. 
And at the start of the at the start of the Cambrian period, which is also the start of the Paleozoic era, which is the era that immediately precedes the age of dinosaurs, at the very start of this, we have the rapid appearance of arthropods, of mollusks, the group that includes clams and snails and octopi. We also see various groups of worms that we can recognize now, like segmented worms and flatworms. We even see the earliest fish showing up. And importantly, a lot of these organisms have hard parts. Arthropods like the Zonomalacaris have hard parts. Clams and brachiopods have hard shells. And Pacaya and other ancestors of fish have either skeletons or, car or cartilage that preserves relatively well. I will say though, that one reason we have such a good record of the Cambrian explosion is that it appears that ocean chemistry conditions somewhat inhibited decomposition by microorganisms during this time. And in some places like the Burgess Shale of Canada, where a lot of these organisms were identified from, you have impressions of soft bodied organisms. You have impressions of worms and other organisms that didn't appear to have hard parts. So yes, we have more hard part, we have more organisms that have, that have shells and skeletons that'll preserve. We also got lucky in that ocean chemistry conditions appear to have enabled better fossilization. So there is some question as to whether the extreme diversification during the Cambrian explosion might be a little bit of an artifact of the preservation conditions, but we don't see really any of these groups before the Cambrian explosion at all. So it appears that a lot of them showed up at once. And this appears to have somewhat to do with the end of snowball earth, as well as the increased levels of oxygen. Earth was again warm by this point, and Antarctica had, Antarctica was in part covered by a shallow sea because sea level rose when snowball earth came to an end. Remember when glaciers go away, that water goes back into the ocean and sea level rises up. And the edges of Antarctica were covered with warm shallow seas that lay over the continental shelf, that lay over the extension of the continental crust out in the ocean. And we don't have as many fossils from the Cambrian explosion in Antarctica that we do from the Burgess Shale, but we have found a lot of, we have still found similar organisms in Antarctica, and we found primitive corals and other creatures that indicate that there was a tropical sea from the Cambrian onwards for quite a while. Antarctica, Antarctica was still, Antarctica partially because the world was warm and partially because it still wasn't all that close to the South Pole, was a war, was to a large extent covered in warm oceans. There wasn't much life on the continents at all just yet. The colonization of the lands happened later. And I mentioned briefly that there was a mountain building event that occurred, that there were some mountain building events that occurred after the main period of building the Antarctic Craton. And the topic of my research is actually a small mountain building event called the Rosserogeny that occurred during the Cambrian period after Rodinia had ceased to exist. And the on the slide that I'll show you on the next, the next slide I'll show you the rocks that I was studying, which are the dark Lamprophyre dikes cut across the gray background rock, which is the granite that formed from subduction during the orogeny. The Lamprophyres that I was looking at are the last rocks from subduction during an orogeny. And it can be a big challenge to look at old rocks and filter out the evidence of newer events while you're trying to study something that happened 500 million years ago. The rocks that I was looking at were from the Cambrian explosion period. There were also some rocks in the area that were from volcanic eruptions that occurred much more recently, in some cases as recently as 3 million years ago. And I had to be careful not to mix up the two rocks. And again, Antarctica doesn't have anything in the way of continental collision now, but even as late as the Cambrian period, it did. There was subduction going off the coast of East Antarctica, and that was actually causing continental collision, both from little bits of crust that were being rafted to it, as well as from Antarctica being pushed up against other continents. And you'll notice that by this point, Antarctica is no longer attached to Southwest to southwestern North America. It's attached to South America, Africa, Australia, the Indian subcontinent, and Madagascar. And Antarctica will remain very heavily associated with these continents for much of the rest of its history. And again, this is what I mean. You have this granite, and then you have the rocks cutting across it. 
And remember that the rule of cross-cutting relations says that whatever cuts, that if something is cut across by something else, the something else is younger. The lamprophyres cut across the granite, and so they must be younger than the granite. And the term for the continent that composed Antarctica and these other continents is Gondwana. And Gondwana is a smaller supercontinent that would eventually fuse with the northern continents to form Pangaea. But it was kind of a mini supercontinent that existed both before Pangaea for a while and then after Pangaea for a while. And it is consisted, it, it is composed of Africa, South America, the Indian subcontinent, Australia, Antarctica, and then Zealandia, which is now something of a lost continent and that a lot of it is below sea level, but it's continental crust that includes New Zealand and actually stretches as far north as New Caledonia. So fun fact, New Caledonia used to be attached to Australia and New Zealand. It's not a newer volcanic island. And so there's actually some really interesting ancient plant life there that has close relatives in New Zealand and Africa as well, because they both were attached to one another as part of Gondwana previously. And for much of the Paleozoic era, the trends that we see in the marine life of the shallow seas around Antarctica very closely resembles that that we find in Australia. And in the Silurian period, when we finally did begin to get more um, life on the land, we start to see similar land plants when we find fossils in Australia to those that we find in Antarctica. And the colonization of the land began in the Silurian, continued in the Devonian period as amphibians started to colonize the land. It really took off during a period known as the Carboniferous, which you'll notice that we've fast forwarded quite a bit. We've gone to 359 million years forward to another highlight. And much of Gondwana was covered by swamps in this period. The swamps were these sort of forest swamps where you had some conifers, but you had lots of tree ferns and horsetails, those plants that you find growing in wet areas today, and club mosses, primitive plants, not flowering plants at all, because those had not appeared yet. And these plants formed rich swamps all over the continent. The world was very steamy at this time. It also appears that oxygen levels were higher during this period. And that led to the evolution of, in some cases, giant insects. But the interesting thing about these coal swamps is that as the name indicates, they are actually the origin for coal. What, happens, what happened is that there was such a high growth rate in these swamps that when the plants died, they would be very quickly buried by the remnants of other plants before they could completely decompose. They would be buried below the, grand, below the ground by the very fast accumulation of plants. And before they could completely decay, they would lithify into coal. The pressure of the overlying sediments and the overlying dead plants would convert the dead would convert the lowest dead plants into coal. And that's one reason why coal is that that's the big reason why coal is known as a fossil fuel. It is formed from the remnants of dead swamp plants, largely from the Carboniferous period, which is indeed named because worldwide these these coal forming swamps were all over the place. Most of the coal on Earth actually formed during the Carboniferous, although some some of the Antarctic coal um, formed during the Permian period a bit later on. So not all coal formed during this time, but a lot of it did. And yes, we have coal in Antarctica today. We have fossil trees from the Carboniferous period in this area that clearly does not have a forest now. And we have coal deposits. And coal cannot be extracted from Antarctica legally, which is something we'll come back to when we talk about the Antarctic Treaty. But Coal is found in several places in the Trans-Antarctic Mountains, and it could possibly be extracted, but it is not allowed to be because of the Antarctic Treaty. Now, the Carboniferous period was pretty warm, and the early Permian was as well, but by the mid-Permian, we had entered another ice age. We actually, again, find evidence in Antarctica of a glacier covering much of the continent, and we have evidence that Antarctica was part of was part of Gondwana as well as Pangaea during this time. Antarctica was very closely associated with Australia and India and Africa and South America and New Zealand still. And for a lot of the Permian, this was joined to the Northern continents as well. And 
during most of the period, during most of the Permian period, climates were relatively cold. Antarctica was closer to the South Pole by this point. Antarctica was starting to approach the South Pole, but not quite there. And you had an ice sheet covering much of it. They would find evidence of this glaciation as evidence of continental drift later on. They would also find a fossil known as Glossopteris, which is a um, which is a seed fern. It's a group of ferns that are extinct now, but they found Glossopteris in Antarctica as well as Australia and these other southern other southern continents, and that indicated that forests of this tree fern of this seed fern were all over those continents, and that indicated that these continents had been attached. They also they also found fossils of some of the earliest large land animals. The Permian period was the end of the Paleozoic era, right before the age of dinosaurs. And it's sort of a prequel to the age of dinosaurs in that you see the first large land animals develop. If you've ever seen an, a display of dinosaurs and seen one that walks on four legs, has meat eating teeth and has a sail on its back, that is not actually a dinosaur, nor did it live alongside dinosaurs. It lived tens of millions of years before the first dinosaurs evolved in the Permian period, and it is actually more closely related to mammals. The ancestors, the earliest ancestors of mammals actually showed up at the end of the Carboniferous period and then proliferated during the Permian and occupied a large number of land niches like herbivores and large predators, as well as lake swimming organisms. And this is important because, as I, as I mentioned before, life started in the ocean and it hadn't really taken a hold on land until pretty recently before this. We went from having life in the oceans and then near the end of the Paleozoic, we get the coal swamps. And then after that, we start seeing more animals colonizing the land. And some evidence indicates that these mammal ancestors, known as synapsids, fared well because they were somewhat well adapted to the cold climate, or at least the colder climate than usual. They may not necessarily have been warm blooded in the modern sense, but there's some evidence indicating that they had similar, that their skin had glands like those of modern mammals. Um, but the era of these ancestral mammals would not last, it would give way to the dinosaur age all good things must come to an end. And the Paleozoic and the Permian would come to an end with a mass extinction. Species are always going extinct. Background extinction refers to the fact that there will always be species disappearing, but we don't necessarily have fewer organisms as a result of that because new organisms are evolving all the time. But in a mass extinction, you have background, you have way more species than background extinction would predict disappearing all at once, and you don't rapidly have anything replacing them. And a mass extinction indicates a global cataclysm usually. Most famously, one mass extinction was caused by the asteroid that wiped out the vast majority of the dinosaurs. But the Extinction that wiped out most dinosaurs was not actually the most dead was not actually the most deadly mass extinction in regards to the proportion of life that was wiped out. You'll notice that on here, this indicates that about three quarters of all life on Earth was wiped out during this extinction. There's also a couple that we've skimmed over. There was um, there was a mass extinction caused in the Ordovician by another small ice age that I didn't really talk about much. At the end of the Permian, there was a mass extinction that wiped out 96% of all marine life and 76% of all terrestrial life. That is a staggering percentage of marine life lost. And it wiped out a lot of, it wiped out a lot of the diverse marine life, like several groups of corals, the trilobites, and a number of fish groups. But on land, it really drastically affected the synapsids, the ancestors of mammals. Some of them obviously did survive. I'm, I'm here, you're here, and we are all mammals. But mammals during the dinosaur era have this reputation as having been occupied, as having occupied the niches that no, nothing else would occupy, as being scavengers and eating insects and living at night and kind of staying away from the dinosaurs. And that is because the ancestors of mammals went into a very steep decline because of the Permian extinction. They would largely be outcompeted by dinosaurs until most dinosaurs themselves went extinct 
millions of years later, and the surviving mammals rebounded into the modern diversity of mammals. Now, the Permian extinction was not caused by an asteroid impact. Scientists originally looked for one, thinking that there might be a similar cause to the dinosaur extinction, but the dinosaur extinction didn't quite as heavily destroy marine life as the Permian extinction did. And so they began to look for a hypothesis that would explain why the oceans were so heavily affected. And the hypothesis seems eerily familiar to the ongoing situation with ocean acidification. And it appears that throughout the world, there was a lot of coal left behind by the coal swamps. In one area, in Siberia, those coal swamps were overrun with lava flows. There was a large volcanic episode that produced lava flows that covered a very large portion of Siberia, that covered a portion of Siberia that's larger than, I would say this, as a guess, this is, this is about the size of the country of Kazakhstan. And not only did that, not only did that release a lot of toxic gases into the air, but it appears that the Siberian traps, these, these lava flows actually ignited coal that was buried not very deeply. And fossil fuels in general have not been burned except by humans, but this appears to have been one exception when a large amount of coal was ignited by a nearby massive eruption of lava flows and the carbon dioxide that was released from burning that coal was all released into the, into the atmosphere during a pretty short interval of time. It was rapidly absorbed by the ocean and when carbon dioxide is absorbed into the ocean, it creates carbonic acid. A little bit of carbonic acid is manageable, but a lot of it forming at once will kill marine life. It'll inhibit organisms that build their shells out of carbonate from doing so, and it will cause mass die-offs of organisms, including plankton, including the photosynthetic plankton that are the base of the food chain. And this is basically what's going on with humans burning fossil fuels today. Humans are burning a lot of are burning fossil fuels that were until we got their, our hands on it buried in the ground and we are releasing CO2 very rapidly into the atmosphere. And the Permian extinction was is essentially what could happen with runaway carbon dioxide. And it's not something we really want to be emulating because the Permian extinction killed 95% of all marine life and a lot of land life too. It was devastating. But one group that would have, would one group that would be able to take advantage of this was the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs, it turns out, appeared during a wave of evolutionary radiation after the Permian extinction, and we will get to them including dinosaurs that we find in Antarctica in the next class. So again, apologies for putting this out so late at night. You all have a good weekend. And I will see you next week. On Monday, I'll be having a review session about this week's lectures, as well as outlining some of what's going to be on the midterm exam. So have a good night and take care.